Hello. Uh, it has been so long since we've gotten together, I feel like I need to introduce myself. But I am Jim Williams. I am one of many members of the Coronavirus Response Task Force that Brian and David have put together here at Trinity. And today, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Paul Gepfert. Dr. Gepfert is a professor of, of medicine in the Department of Infectious Disease at UAB, and he has been the point man, the leader in our vaccine research clinic and research trials. And so he's here today uh, to answer our questions about the COVID vaccine and to address any concerns that you may have. Before we get started, I might ask Paul just to tell us a little bit about himself, All make right. him seem more like a human being. <laughs> Thanks for having me here, Jim. Um, so I grew up in Houston, Texas, but uh, my family is originally from Chile, South America. Um, and, uh, but I grew up there and uh, unfortunately they didn't speak Spanish at home. So um, I uh, learned most of my Spanish because they divorced when they got to the US. Uh, I learned most of my Spanish in uh, taking care of patients. And so a lot of people think I speak with a Mexican accent, which <laughs> is kind of interesting. Anyway, since then, I moved here and did all my training here um, in, at, at UAB. Um, I'm married to an obstetrician who does high-risk pregnancy, and I have, we have two boys, uh, and they're both grown now out of the house. They both live in Denver. Wow. <laughs> it must be fun. Do you ski? Not like they do. <laughs> <laughs> but I... Yeah, it's funny how when your kids get a lot better at something than you were, and uh, but yeah, they're insane the way mm -hmm. they. I, I don't keep up with them. I just. Oh. Well, just wait. Soon they will be better at everything. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you quit competing. <laughs> anyway, well, let's get started. So the first question, uh, I guess, is regarding the series of questions are regarding safety of the vaccine. So there are two vaccines available now, and. Um, a third soon on the way, the, the Johnson & Johnson, the Moderna, and the Pfizer. So what are the safety concerns of these vaccines? A lot of people have concerns of the novel nature. They're injecting RNA or DNA into their body, and it's kind of a novel approach. So what are the concerns? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So let's just tackle the first two vaccines, which are the ones that are available currently, which is the Pfizer and the Moderna mRNA vaccine. That's completely novel technology, so it does give people some pause about the safety. Um, but we've tested these vaccines like we test all our vaccines. Uh, in, in we do phase one, two studies, which is first time in humans, um, and then uh, make sure that it's safe and well tolerated. And then we test uh, the efficacy studies. And these, which is, which is in, in this case, it was in 30,000 patients or participants, we call it, we say in the Moderna trial and 45,000 participants in the Pfizer trial. And we look at tolerability, so how well do you tolerate it, meaning, you know, how does it cause arm pain? And in 90% of the people, it does cause, um, a, you know, some pain in the arm. And then the other one is what we call systemic symptoms, which are reactions that your body has throughout, like you can get a headache, you can get fatigue, which are some of the more common ones. You can also get muscle aches in very, uh, uh, like about less than 1% of people get, actually get a fever, uh, especially after the second dose. But all these things resolve in one or two days, and that's what we've, we've seen. So in terms of side effects, which we've seen in what, let's say 100,000 people, um, we, we know all that. Now, when you start vaccinating now, and the, the vaccine is available, you start vaccinating much more than 100,000 people. You get into the millions of people. And then we started seeing actually uh, anaphylaxis um, that may be a little higher than what you see with certainly like penicillin. So penicillin, we see um, anaphylaxis about one in a, um, 100,000 to a million. And it looks like these vaccines can cause anaphylaxis, which is an immediate, immediate allergic reaction in about one in 100,000 people. Now, nobody has died from this, and um, if you are getting vaccinated, uh, all vaccine places should have an epinephrine pen to give you um, uh, in case that were to happen. And they're trying to figure out why it possibly causes a little bit more anaphylaxis than your average vaccine. Um, uh, and it may have to do with the polyethylene glycol, which is part of the, the particle, the the layer outside of the mRNA, because if you just give R mRNA, it degrades immediately. Um, and even when you put this lipid nanoparticle around it, 
as you know, you ha still have to store it at minus 20 degrees Celsius or even colder. Um, so anyway, so those are those things, and I'm sure we're going to see some more things that happen just as a very rare event, right? One in a million or less event. Um, For our purposes, could you briefly define anaphylaxis? What yeah, is so that? anaphylaxis is uh, what happens is, is that you, um, you get an injection and your body has an, an immune response to the injection, and it's, an, it, it's sort of a pre-existing, you've had a pre-existing immune response to it. And uh, unfortunately, what can happen is you can get, um, well, it can be anything. It can be just a skin rash. It can be hives. It occurs right after or within a few minutes, 15 to 30 minutes after the injection. Uh, and then if it's severe, it can cause facial swelling, tongue swelling. You can have a hard time breathing. It can cause wheezing. Um, but they're rapidly uh, can be um, uh, reversed with an epinephrine pen. And so a lot of people, for instance, who have bee sting allergies, that's an anaphylaxis. Okay. Um, so if you <coughs> get the less extreme anaphylaxis, rash, hives, but no breathing problems, should you get the second vaccine? So right now there's several, there's only a few contraindications to getting the COVID vaccines. Uh, the first is if you have uh, anaphylaxis or an immediate allergic reaction to any COVID vaccine or its component. So obviously, you would have never gotten the COVID vaccine before. So we've had several people who developed hives 10 minutes after they get um, the vaccine, and they're not supposed to get another vaccine. They shouldn't get the another case. one. Yeah. <clears throat> is there any way, one, is there any way to predict who's going to get that? I guess there's no way, is there? Well, people who, who have, um, so some people have histories of anaphylaxis to other vaccines, so flu vaccines, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, they are at higher risk, but um, so should they get a COVID vaccine? And that's a really good question. And, and generally, it's not an absolute contraindication. So it, you don't say, well, you just cannot get it. But you should probably refer them to an allergy immunologist uh, and be extremely careful uh, when you vaccinate. And then <clears throat> is there any way to pre-medicate to prevent anaphylaxis or severe reaction? And does that decrease the effectiveness of the vaccine then? Yeah, the <laughs> you can premedicate. Um, uh -huh. So, for instance, you could give steroids, <laughs> but if you gave steroids before that, then you would probably completely then the vaccine would be worthless. Be it? Very ineffective. You can give uh, ibuprofen, Tylenol, um, and uh, even those things diminish the immune response. Although it, you probably still get some immune response. Benadryl probably wouldn't do much of diminishment, but that's why an allergy immunologist would be good to consult with okay. to see what kind of medicine you can give for that. And so here's my favorite question. Where does the RNA come from that they make these vaccines out of? Uh, what do you mean? Like what they make it actually. Yeah, but like how do they manufacture it? Is it like a recombinant DNA procedure? There's a way that you can actually, so these are nucleotides and you can actually add the nucleotides. There's a way to chemically add nucleotides together to make the exact RNA that you want. And that's okay. what they do. So it's a manufacturer, it's mm -hmm. not from dead viruses no. they've collected no. or anything like that. I mean, okay. they, they figured out that it's a genetic code, right? RNA is a genetic yeah. code. So the, the way the cell makes stuff, it, you have DNA, which is in, your, in the very deep parts of your cell called the nucleus. And then that gets what's called transcribed to RNA and, and messenger RNA. And messenger RNA is uh, specifically what happens with messenger RNA. It is actually the template that the cell uses to make the actual protein, which is, you know, the, it's the uh, s structural part of your cells. Um, and so, so the mRNA, then what we've done is we've just figured out which one COVID makes the one we want, which is the spike protein of COVID, we figured out exactly the sequence. And quickly, that's what's great about the mRNA technology is you can rapidly make a vaccine. And within a week, they already made the vaccine. Within a week that they knew what the sequence was, which was published by the Chinese, uh, January 10th, I believe, on the 17th of January of last year, they had the vaccine. And they just synthesize it um, and then encapsulate it, and you've mm -hmm. got your vaccine. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, well, that is great. So what is the difference between emergency approval and then standard FDA approval? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's just a provisional approval. So, the, And the reason for that is um, because they want 
uh, six months of safety data in, 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 in large groups of people and they, and they want um, more long-term <coughs> data. So that's why it's an emergency use authorization because it's based on just two months of safety data. Um, it, yeah. Is there any concern that this was rushed too much, that they cut too many corners, that maybe there are some safety concerns that weren't addressed in going for the emergency approval? I don't think so. So it's interesting. We've been very lucky to get this very quickly. I mean, it is the most rapid vaccine that's been um, developed. And so I think a lot of people are rightfully concerned that maybe it was rushed. But First of all, we had we threw a huge amount of money on it, <laughs> and so and so there was a, a a great urgency to develop a vaccine quickly. But we still did the the phase one, two, and three studies, which are standard, and we did it in at least as many people, if not more, than most vaccines are developed. And so the early the the development in testing the safety in these individuals was at least as many numbers and and at least as much safety endpoints, if you will, as any other vaccine, uh, and in fact, in some cases, more so. Now, uh, obviously, we don't know the long-term, not the long-term, we don't know the side, of the, um, like I said before, we don't know the unusual side effects, the very rare side effects, but we don't know that for other vaccines either. And then the other reasons that it was developed so rapidly is because, as I said before, mRNA, you can rapidly make a vaccine more than anything else, um, and so that's one reason. Um, and then also um, we, we had community engagement. Uh, so we had people who volunteered to vaccinate coming out from everywhere. We had huge numbers of people that wanted to, to volunteer to vaccinate. And that's usually difficult. Um, so I've been working with HIV vaccines for 20 plus years, and it's hard to get people to volunteer for that, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But this one, there were many people who wanted to do it. So we got rapid enrollment in our clinical studies. Um, yeah, I know I had a lot of patients who were turned away, who wanted to sign up, who right. wanted to get the experimental yeah, vaccine. Exactly. Oh. And, then, and then finally, sadly, um, we've had in, in the U.S. and other parts of the world really high rates of continued transmission. Uh, and, but uh, sort of um, ironically, you need high rates of continued transmission to, well, you need continued transmission to, to show whether it works or not because you vaccinate uh, in let's say 15,000 in Moderna, you vaccinate with the actual uh, vaccine, 15,000 you get placebo. Neither the person injecting it or the investigator nor the person being injected knows what they got. And you follow them over time to see and at hope, hope at the end of the study that the people who got vaccine are protected from COVID by, from natural exposure mm -hmm. to COVID. Um, and because there was such high rates of transmission in the United States and other places that of the world where this was done in the United Kingdom, South Africa, and Brazil, uh, and South America, we got answers very quickly. So basically you need people in the placebo group to get sick. Well, yeah, <laughs> essentially that's correct. Um, yeah, and in fact, it's interesting, as you know, China uh, did some sort of draconian uh, lockdown measures that we just can't do in the United States because we don't have that kind of system. Mm -hmm. um, and they el basically eliminated the large number of transmissions, and they couldn't do any of their vaccine studies in <laughs> China. They had to go to other countries to do them. Okay, very interesting. And so here's a question, uh, several questions similar to this. I'm on Humira for uh, psoriasis. Should I get the vaccine? Uh, so the simple answer is yes. Uh, Humira, Humira is, it is an immune modulating agent. It doesn't completely uh, so you likely will not respond quite as well. But on the other hand, being on Humira, um, you also um, are at higher risk of, of complications of COVID. Um, so uh, you should probably get vaccinated and hope that um, you get a pretty good immune response with it. And so substitute in there, kidney transplant, bone marrow transplant, dialysis patient, HIV patient, any concerns with any of those well, immunocompromised? Take, so first of all, let me back up. Um, the vaccines, all the vaccines that have been developed, so the two mRNA vaccines and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that will hopefully be approved by the FDA emergency use authorization by this weekend, they are all safe to give in people with even severe immune compromise because they are not what are called live attenuated vaccines. So like measles, mumps, rubella, for instance, you cannot give those vaccines to people who are 
immune compromised, including uh, somebody on Humira. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but because the problem with that is that they, they can actually, um, because they're what are called attenuated, they still grow, can grow at very slow rates in the body. And if you don't have an immune response, a good immune response, it, it can cause disease in these individuals. But these vaccines, um, uh, the COVID vaccines cannot uh, grow in the body. They just sort of, if you will, deliver the payload and then that's it. It cannot cause infection. Um, so they're absolutely safe in people who are immune compromised. They can't, you can't get COVID from them. You can't get um, uh, anything else from them. So the question is, if you ha are a transplant patient, uh, I think it depends. Um, right now, it's not, uh, they're not part of the top tier because we're worried that they're not going to respond very well. Um, so at this point, we're not recommending in people who, who are on a lot of immunosuppressive for transplant. Now, it's likely going to be depend on how much immune transplant, and I think this is going to have to be something that the, the patient discusses with their provider, perhaps in consultation with some, a vaccinologist to determine if it's, if it's good for them to get a vaccine. And it actually brings up a really important point, and that is the whole concept of herd immunity or community protection. There's always going to be people in our society who cannot respond to a vaccine, uh, and they rely on other people around them that can respond to the vaccine. And the only way you're going to protect them from COVID is by having a, a circle of protection, if you will, friends, family, even people you don't know who can respond to the vaccine, and so therefore you then protect them against the, the disease. So how many will it take to uh, reach herd immunity, and when do you think we'll get there? <laughs> I don't know uh, when we'll get there. Um, and the, <laughs> the problem is the bar keeps moving. Uh, the original strain, the wild type strain that you know, uh, started this whole mess, uh, we probably needed 60%, 70% people to either be infected or vaccinated uh, to reach herd immunity. With this strain that was first identified in England, uh, the B1171 strain, it's highly transmissible. Fortunately, the vaccine works against it, but it's highly transmissible. It, because it's highly transmissible, you're talking now 70 to 80 percent of, of people to be vaccinated. And remember, the kids can't get vaccinated yet because it hasn't been approved in right. children under 18 years of age. Um, and so I think until we get children vaccinated as well, we probably aren't going to reach herd immunity. And <laughs> according and so to the, the Wall Street the, Journal, we'll I be there a year or two uh, from now, maybe. So the Wall Street Journal says we'll be there by April. Uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity. I, you, I mean, it, it, you know, so the problem is we have, uh, how many people in the U.S. now have been infected? Three, 30, oh. 30 million, something mm -hmm. like that, right? Yeah, though there are some estimates million, that... And then, and then they think that that's a, uh, an underestimate. Right. So you multiply it by that. So you're talking about 58 million 14% of people have gotten their first shot. Now, some of those have been infected already. Um, but at any rate, you can see where we could be getting close to sort of 50 to 60% by April. Okay. I think that's where they come from. And sure, I, I mean, and, and remember that um, uh, the government just recently announced that they will have 600 million doses of vaccine by, by, the, end of this, by the beginning of the summer in June. Um, and so uh, if you deliver all that and everybody says, yes, I'm going to take a vaccine. Now, you know, the other problem is vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. is a big thing, especially among our African-American colleagues. Uh, it's only in this state 40 plus percent that want to take the vaccine. Uh, and even in other individuals, uh, non-African-American, it's like 67 percent. So if you think about that, we don't mm -hmm. even reach, you, you can't even get it there. So. Um, however, it could be that you vaccinate the people who want to be vaccinated, the other people get infected and will reach herd immunity. Okay. So I, don't, <laughs> I think summer is not a bad estimate. Uh, start vaccinating everybody maybe by the end of summer for college football, and then everybody can go to the game. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's all the, we care about. That's all we care about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when is the first game? Um, so, and you touched on the next question. So how concerned should we be that children are not being vaccinated and will there be vaccine trials 
for children or when is that so those change? are starting uab is starting a uh, dr suresh bopana is actually leading those efforts uh for both the pfizer vaccine and the uh, moderna vaccine are already uh starting trials in children um and what the end point of that is i'm not entirely sure yet it's going to depend on the fda it may mm -hmm. be you know one uh, Maybe all they need is we need to show that they have a certain immune response and we're good and it's safe. Um, and, then, and then maybe they'll approve it. Um, but yes, I, I think we're less than a year away to having uh, in children. And they're going all the way down to like six months of age. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the trials are going to go to six months? They start, they start in a graded fashion. So they start like uh, 16 to 18. And then if that looks safe and well tolerated, then they go lower and lower and lower. And one thing about these vaccines is the, the tolerability, like the, the local pain and, and the fever and, and the headaches do tend to be more severe in people who are younger. And so that is something that they're going to look, look at very carefully. Yeah. So I'm just curious if it's hard to get people to volunteer for those trials. I would gladly volunteer myself, but my infant child, I'm not so sure I would put them up for you know, a trial. You know, I'm not an expert in that area. I'm uh -huh. not a pediatrician, but Dr. David Kimberlin and Dr. Suresh Bapana, they are experts in that. It's somewhat difficult, and you obviously, uh, and obviously the child can't consent. Um, mm -hmm. It has to be a parent who consents for the child. Um, but there are a lot of parents who um, believe that vaccines are extremely important. Um, and and just as, as a digression, um, vaccines, the reason they've caused such incredible, so humans have done a lot of things to sort of decrease morbidity and mortality, death and destruction, if you will, in, in, in the population, a lot of advances in medicine. Um, the number one thing that we've done is to provide clean food and water. Number two is vaccines. And, and the reason the vaccines are so effective is because of children, uh, because we vaccinate children and they have a great immune response uh, and then we also have ways of, of having them in a situation where you need vaccines for school, for instance. So um, clearly, in order for us to really be successful in reaching herd immunity, we have to have children vaccinated. And we, again, we rely on people who, are, who realize that situation uh, and realize that, uh, that these trials are very safe. They've already been shown to be safe in adults, um, so it's it's not really that likely that it's going to be that dangerous in children. And I think a lot of All parents right. realize that. Yeah, we've already seen a significant drop in life expectancy just from one year of coronavirus. Right, it's just incredible. Right. Yeah, you yeah. realize as doctors we take pride in what we do, but it's really the public health people who've changed. No, I know it's incredible. Yeah, hopefully that'll come back up again. Yeah, hopefully so. So, uh, and then the next question, planning to get pregnant or pregnant, should I get the vaccine? Why or why not? I mean, so they were excluded from the trials, correct? Planning, planning to get pregnant uh, wasn't, uh, they were all excluded from the trials. Um, and so, um, yes, it's recommended that, I think if you're planning to get pregnant, you ought to get vaccinated before you get pregnant. That's the best situation. Uh -huh. um, and the mRNA, let me just say the mRNA is highly labile it degrades very quickly. What happens with the mRNA is it goes into the muscle. The muscle uh, then what's called translates, it produces protein. So you use your muscle cells to be protein uh, factories. It makes the protein as exactly the way SARS-CoV-2 is made, makes that protein the surface part of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, I'm sorry. Um, and, and then it makes that, the immune system looks at it, says this is uh, an invader it makes its army to protect against it. And so then when you get, ch when you get uh, exposed to it, then it immediately recognizes it as a foreign invader and can attack it. And the muscle cell, once the RNA happens, it, that RNA degrades. Um, and some of the muscle cells probably get eliminated by the immune system. So it doesn't hang around your body. And so there's no worry that it's uh -huh. gonna go into the fetus, for instance. Um, and so it's absolutely safe in somebody wanting to get pregnant if you get the vaccine before pregnancy. So now we talk about somebody who's already pregnant. So it, none of the pre they are doing some studies in pregnancy now, but they have not done them yet. Um, but the major medical societies, including the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecology, recommend that pregnant women be vaccinated because 
the likelihood that this is going to cause a bad outcome in pregnancy is very, very low. And it's certain that women who are pregnant have high risks of having complications with COVID, including death. Um, and so if you want to protect uh, the pregnant woman, they ought to get a vaccine. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say they ought to, but it's, it's not contraindicated. And if, if the pregnant woman wants to get a vaccine, they should get a vaccine. Okay, great. And, and that includes breastfeeding women as well. Okay, and so your wife is advising her patients to consider it? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. very good. And we've seen a lot of patients at UAB who are pregnant or just delivered uh, and got severe COVID, get on, get on the ventilator. I mean, it's terrible. Uh, as, as you know, influenza does the same thing, but this is even worse uh, in pregnant women. So. All right, so what if I had COVID? Why do I need to get the vaccine? Well, uh, so. Sorry, I just lost my mic. Oh. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, the vaccine, there's data that the vaccine probably works in many cases better than infection. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is you don't need the vaccine right away because infection does work to protect you against reinfection for a period of time. That period of time is probably anywhere from three to six months. Um, but after that, uh, there are, you probably are running the risk of getting reinfected. And I'm not sure, this may be getting a little bit too much into the weeds, but it's an interesting story. So in South Africa, they have a, a variant strain there that's called B1351. And the vast majority of the new infections of COVID there are because of this strain. And that strain is actually relatively resistant to neutralization uh, that is um, developed in people who were infected by the original strain. And in fact, uh, in people who have prior infection with the first strain, and then they get infected, uh, and then they get exposed to the second strain, they have no protection against that second strain. However, if you vaccinate them, they actually have protection. It's not as good as the 90 plus percent, um, but it's in the anywhere from 50 to 60 percent protection, and it protects them against severe disease at 90 percent. Uh, and so they won't get hospitalized or intubated, for instance. And so that's sort of a long-winded way to say that the vaccine likely is going to be better than infection, and it's going to protect you more. It's not like infection doesn't protect you from reinfection at all. It's just not as good as vaccine. So the difference in the South African variant, is it in the spike protein, and can the vaccine quickly be changed to... Yes. To, to that's both that? are correct. So it's in the spike protein. Well, there's lots of different mutations in that variant, but it has some key variants, in not only in the spike protein, but in the part of the spike protein that actually binds to the cell, which is called the receptor binding domain. Um, and yes, that's true. And they've already made the vaccine. Several of the companies have Moderna, Pfizer, Novavax, and I think Johnson & Johnson have all made the second generation vaccines that has this sort of South African variant. And they're starting studies probably uh, beginning of next month uh, to see if it's, and it's, so uh, this gets into another weeds. They probably can't do the same kind of studies now. They're probably just gonna be able to show that it's safe and immunogenic and then say, we're gonna use this strain instead and preliminary studies are interesting because they look like the new strain this south we don't i hate to call it the south african strain but b1351 is not that doesn't roll off not the as tongue. catchy is it no. <laughs> but that if you vaccinate with that strain it actually protects against the old strain too um and so it then if i get this question asked a lot and maybe this was one of them are we going to have to get vaccinated frequently and i think I, it's hard to predict. It has to do with how many strains come up and then also how long your immune system lasts after vaccination, the answer to which we don't know absolutely. But I suspect that it's going to be something like influenza where every year we're going to have to have uh, an, our COVID vaccine shot. But, you know, it's, it, I can see that companies will develop you know, right now, influenza has four different, three or four different types of influenza in it. I can imagine that somebody could do 
three or four influenza and your flu shot, and then in that same shot, add the COVID vaccine as well. Yeah. So I, I, Except that if it's an MRA, you know, and then keeping it frozen would then complicate flu shot as yeah, well. And right. <clears throat> well, maybe if the Johnson & Johnson could be incorporated. Yeah, and Novavax is another study. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very, <coughs> that's our oldest protein. That's older vaccine technology. That's the protein-based technology where you actually make the protein in the test tube and then use that for your vaccine. Um, that's 90% effective as well against the original strain. Uh, and, and so that could be easily incorporated into sort of a flu vaccine. So do we have any idea how long immunity from the vaccines last? I guess we can't know because we've only been given them for a few months. Yeah, there's two questions to that. So we know that how long antibody lasts for four months. That's all that's published right now. Uh, and we know that it lasts for at least four months. The real question is what is protecting you? And we don't know that. Uh, and studies are being done to show what part of your immune system is protecting you against COVID. Mm -hmm. And there's probably two different answers to that. There's protecting you against infection and there's protecting you against disease, severe disease. And they may be two different answers to that. Um, uh, but the antibody response, which we think is what's important in, in terms of protecting you against infection, um, lasts at least four months for the Moderna vaccine. Um, what they're doing now, though, is interesting, is they're trying to see how long the vaccine protection lasts. Doesn't matter what immunity he, you have, how long does the vaccine work to protect you? And they're doing these things that are called crossover studies. So, for instance, the Moderna vaccine we know is effective. 15,000 people got the vaccine, but the other 15,000 didn't get the vaccine. And the 15,000 who got the vaccine got the vaccine like six months ago. So now what they're doing is they're unblinding everybody and the people who didn't get the vaccine are gonna get the vaccine, and so they're getting the vaccine six months later, and then, then they can look and see, do the people who got the vaccine six months ago, does their protection, is it not as good as the people who just got the vaccine, or right. is it as good? And then we right. can know that it lasts at least six months. And so the question between disease and infection, how do we know, or when will we know if after having the vaccine we can still spread the coronavirus? Are we? We're learning that too, um, and in fact, Johnson & Johnson has some data that it, it's 70 plus percent effective in preventing um, uh, asymptomatic infection, uh, which then means that you're not transmitting it. Um, uh, and so, and um, AstraZeneca, which is the, uh, the Oxford vaccine, mm -hmm. also has some data with that, and uh, Pfizer has some data in real world in Israel now that it's preventing transmission as well. Um, now. None of this is peer-reviewed yet, um, but it looks like it is protecting against transmission as well. But that gets to the fact that we don't know that yet. Th what we do know is that these vaccines are preventing you yourself from getting infected with symptomatic COVID, so COVID with symptoms, and severe disease. Um, however, you don't know if you can transmit it, and there may be a window. I think it's sh a shorter window, but you can probably transmit it some. Uh, and so that's why it's recommended until everybody gets vaccinated or we get the cases way down that people still wear masks, even if you're vaccinated. So um, <clears throat> just a couple more questions about vaccine nuts and bolts. Then I want to get into that a little more. Uh, so a couple of questions have come up. I'm a school nurse, and after my first vaccine, I got COVID. When should I get my second vaccine? Should it be delayed? Should I get it on schedule? So this individual got uh, vaccinated. And then came, was diagnosed with COVID, didn't say, but I assume immediately after the vaccine. So I think you should probably wait three months and then get a vaccine. There's data now actually really interesting that people who have COVID infection and then get one dose of vaccine actually have a better immune response than people who get two doses of vaccine without any prior infection. Now, whether that's long lasting, I don't know. But first of all, within that three months, they're not gonna get reinfected. There's really good data on that. There was a New England Journal paper two, month, two weeks ago that showed that, and CDC has that data. Uh, and secondly, uh, they can wait, and when they do get that one dose, uh, their immune system will, they'll get a really robust immune response. And so the next question is, what if I miss the second shot for some reason, out of town or delayed or snowstorm? Uh, how do I make that up? Is there harm in waiting beyond the three or four weeks? Oh, it depends how much longer, but um, 
So there's no data, but immunologically speaking, it's likely perhaps even better for you to wait longer uh, because it gives your cells, your memory cells, more time to mature and then they can respond better to that boost. I think it's recommended that um, for the Pfizer Moderna vaccine that it's okay to wait if you have to two months. Um, there's data from AstraZeneca, the Oxford vaccine, uh, that isn't approved yet, but it's been shown to be effective in other countries, um, that the immune data and the efficacy data is better. They compared a one-month boost to a, um, what's, what's 12 weeks, four-month boost. And the four-month boost was 90% effective. The one-month boost was 60% mm -hmm. effective. So I, I think it's, you shouldn't stress too far out if you missed your um, boost by a few weeks or whatever. And then the next question is, so I had COVID in January. Why do I have to wait 90 days to get the vaccine? Well, there's, that's a multifaceted answer. Um, I think one is you're, not, you're already protected. I talked about already. So you're not going to get reinfected. Um, and so then that gets into the fact that if you're not going to get reinfected and we have limited resources, it helps to have that vaccine given to somebody else at this point. But then finally, um, we, don't, we, we worry that if you've just got over the infection that the side effects of getting boosted right after that may be significant. Now, there are some individuals who, um, who had really bad COVID and then got their vaccine, and they feel really bad after they get the vaccine. Now, fortunately, it's transient. It lasts like a day or two, but they feel really bad. And so the worry is that if you do it right after COVID, that you may, you know, you may um, uh, make the side effects worse. And so Dr. Sag, who, you know, Mike Sag, who sort of was infected back in March mm -hmm. a year ago, he got really sick, and when he got the, co the COVID vaccine, he said he felt just like he did when he first got COVID, but fortunately it went away very quickly. And I think the worry is that the side effects will be worse. So that's the three reasons that we mm -hmm. recommend that they wait. All right, and now we'll move on to the issue of, I had my vaccine, why can't I go back to normal? Why do I have to wait for herd immunity? Can I go to concerts, go to sporting events? Go hug my grandchildren. You know, I think eventually we will have that answer. I think right now it's a little premature to start doing all that. And eventually I think we will do that. Um, the problem right now is there's just still a lot of unknowns. Uh, and we don't want, you know, it, I think to be frank for you personally. So let me back up. What's amazing about all these vaccine studies. So this is uh, Pfizer, Moderna, Janssen, Novavax, and AstraZeneca. Every one of these studies, they've had a lot of deaths due to COVID in these studies, but they've all been in the placebo group. So nobody who's received vaccine has died due to COVID. Now, it's not going to continue to be that way, but that is pretty protective. And so, yes, you yourself are going to be protected. But the problem is that not, you know, we still don't have herd immunity and we have a lot of people who are still at risk. And so to be... Um, I think it's more to be um, kind to your neighbor kind of thing, uh -huh. uh, that you don't want to be infecting other people. And I think that's why it's sort of a, a I think we, it's a society, it's a responsibility to society kind of thing that you need to do, which is why. But I do think that's gonna change and it's gonna evolve. Um, uh, and so, yes, uh, eventually we will get that way. Uh, and when that happens, I think is difficult to know at this point. How will we know? Will you run up a green flag at the health department and say it's safe to go out again? I think that may be what'll happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It could be like going to the beach where we could have a, a, a green a flag, flag, and a yellow oh, flag, yeah. and a red flag. Mm. But you know, we, there, it, there's a great uh, BamaTracker.com that, that shows all the cases and one of the most important numbers is the percent people who test positive uh -huh. and that's been it's supposed to be under five percent to be sort of okay and we've consistently been way over i think there was one time in at the end of june when we got below five percent for a day and mm -hmm. then we've stayed above and we've been as high as 30 something percent so if we stay below five percent uh -huh. for a period of time and every and 
a significant portion of people have been vaccinated, I think it's probably safe to say that we're going to start going back to normal. And, and looking at that myself and reading Frank McWhorter's blog, I don't know if you ever look at that, but it looks like the denominator is changing on that from day to day, the number of tests we're actually doing. So yeah. doesn't that make kind of the percent positive a little harder to interpret? I mean... Um, I, yeah, I mean, that's going to change day to day, but I think, I th and that's why you can't just say in one mm -hmm. day if it's below 5% to go, but, um, but it's still, they, yeah, I mean, you're right. It has to do with a number of tests as well, but still the percent positive is still pretty okay. fairly good indicator. So just wait for that green flag to go up. There. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Uh, so, but the, the next question is, once everybody high risk over 65 and the nursing home patients are all vaccinated, why can't we go back to normal then? I mean, we're not less likely to kill somebody, right? That's a really good question and maybe we will go back to normal, but uh -huh. we haven't done that yet. Um, you know, the only reason um, is we don't, has to do with these variant strains. I think if I was talking to you six months ago, I'd say great. But unfortunately now, if you talk about viruses that are more uh, infectious and viruses that are escaping in, uh, uh, the immune response and we don't know if they completely escape and none have done that so far but that's why and you know we're we're very cautious but I I agree with you it's very possible that once we have all the people who are at high risk vaccinated then then we'll just go back to normal even if we don't vaccinate uh, the the low risk people so what about the variants? Are they in Alabama yet? Are we concerned about the... Yeah, the variants are in Alabama. The, fortunately, it's not the... That we know of, it's not one that, do, that the vaccine doesn't work against. Okay, great. But the one that was in the United Kingdom, uh, the one that's highly transmissible, is now uh, in Alabama, and it's likely going to be the dominant strain okay. in the next month or so. And then the next series of questions are on... How do, how do I get the vaccine? So I'm 66 and I've signed up with Jefferson County and with UAB and still have no appointment. Should I sign up again? What should I do? <laughs> so as a caveat, I'm not the expert in vaccine distribution. Um, it's not your fault? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's partly my fault. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I'm not the one doling out the vaccines. Mm. Um, However, I will say that we are getting around to it. Uh, there's no, if you've signed up, you, you shouldn't sign up again. Um, you could call your provider, I think, to see what's going on. Um, but people are still waiting in line and we, we still are having a hard time with getting vaccine. UAB um, is doing a phenomenal job of distributing the vaccine that it gets. Um, so just about everything that they get, they, vac they use as to vaccinate. Um, now, I know there are some parts of Alabama that, that hadn't done a, such a good job, but UAB has. And so has the Jefferson County Health Department. Um, so, you know, I think uh, um, they're all ramping up vaccines. So I think within the next month or two, everybody over 65 who wants a vaccine will get a vaccine. I think within the next month, especially if the Janssen vaccine uh, gets approved. The Johnson and Johnson. I'm yeah. sorry, Johnson and Johnson yeah. or Janssen. Janssen. <laughs> uh, all right. And so the next question, similar line, I'm 45 and healthy. When will I get a chance to get a vaccine? Will it be summer? Will it be before I think, that? I think it'll be uh, uh, summer at the latest. Will people be able to choose which vaccine they want? Say, I want the Not Janssen. yet. Uh, certainly not in the next couple, three months. After that, sure. Um, and that's going to be interesting when people are offered the Janssen vaccine or the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. We got it. <laughs> uh, because it's not, it doesn't protect as well against infection, mild to moderate infection of COVID. It's 72% effective versus 95% for the, uh, the mRNAs. But it's one shot and it protects against um, highly protective against uh, severe disease and hospitalization to the tune of almost 90%. So if, what I'm trying to say is if you were offered the, Johns the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you ought to take it. Get it, yeah. grab it. And it doesn't mean you can't get a boost later on with something else if it seems that that's important. So there's no danger in mixing your vaccines? Well, I, I, a boost, the boost would be a Johnson boost, okay. which they're testing now whether okay. a boost is important. But we have had 
participants who have gotten mixed and matched because the Johnson and Johnson trial, uh, there were a lot of healthcare workers and people who had access to vaccine who got on that trial and before they knew it was efficacious, they had been offered the vaccine. And even though they got the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, they didn't know if it worked or not, so they went ahead and took the mRNA vaccine. So we do have some limited data, but not a huge amount of data okay. that it, it, is, it is safe to do that. And my last question, which I'm kind of proud of since we are a religious institution, is vaccine equity. What can we do to make sure that the vaccine is distributed fairly here and abroad? And why should we care that they get the vaccine in Africa? So the latter question I'll answer first. Um, this is a global disease, and you're not going to control a global disease without controlling it globally and you are gonna if you talk about trying to um, uh, decrease the chance of strains coming on and and variant strains and not having to vaccinate all the time you have got to put this under control uh, and you've got to vaccinate the entire world um, and so it's, it's it's extremely important that we do that um, I, I heard this morning that Ghana is the first African country to get uh, shipment of, of vaccines. Um, South Africa is now vaccinating um, healthcare workers through a sort of an emergency situation with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, and so I, I think it's important to do that. And that's just, and that's, that's important from your own personal, our own personal benefit. Mm -hmm. But then beyond that, especially as a religious community, I, I think it's important to sort of take care of your fellow man, whether it be people in your congregation, people outside of your congregation in Birmingham and Alabama and United States, and then beyond that. I mean, uh, people are suffering everywhere with this. Um, and so it's important to try and help your fellow man, I think, and more of a philosophical reason, yeah. but that's why. And what about equity here at home? I mean, the black belt of Alabama probably has had the highest infection rates and death rates of any place in the country even and I've had patients and know people that have driven down to Wilcox County to get a vaccine because they couldn't get one here they were able to get one there should we be telling people that they can go to other counties and try to get the vaccine or should we tell them to wait for Jefferson County because we'll get to them what uh, do you, what's that's a good question uh, my feeling is that the equity issue in terms of not having enough vaccine for people is gonna solve itself in the next few months, which is kind of incredible, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I advise against driving down to take vaccine from somebody else. The, the only problem with that is a lot of people are doing this. I, I, so a lot of people, what happens is, is there's, there are places that they've thawed out too much vaccine and unless they use it, they're gonna lose you it. give to somebody. And in that case, I think it's fine to do it. Yeah, find an arm to uh, give it in. Right. If you're taking it away from other people, then I think that's probably not a great thing. Part of the reason the black belt is probably not distributing as much vaccine as they can is because there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy among the African-American community. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with the really a lot of bad um, trials that were done in the African-American community. And then also, they don't benefit from uh, universal health care. They have lots of problems accessing health care. And so when, s when they don't get any health care and somebody comes to them and say, well, we're not giving you any health care, but here, take this mm. vaccine, they're, they're a bit <laughs> skeptical about yeah. it. And so I think that's the way we need to go forward with trying to get communities is education and, and also to try and get not only COVID vaccine as health care, but other health care to these communities. Is there any source you recommend for reliable information that our people can go to? Where uh, the CDC, for which CDC vaccine reliable. information? The New York Times has fantastic information, and it's free, right? The and COVID. It, um, can, yes, the COVID stuff at the New York Times is free. They have, and they actually have a whole vaccine part that tells you how many vaccines are in development, where they are in development, um, how many people have been vaccinated. It's pretty phenomenal. For COVID and the Alabama, the BamaTracker.com, as I talked about, mm -hmm. has uh, Alabama rates of COVID infection, deaths, the number of people who've gotten vaccinated in Alabama. It has all those things. Oh, great. Uh, <clears throat> well, now I'm going to ask you 
to predict the future. Where do you think we will be with this pandemic? One year, five years? Where do you think we're headed? I think a year from now we'll be back to normal um, as long as we get control of it with the vaccine and there aren't variants to come up. Um, and I think it'll be, I, I really think it's going to be shorter than that. I mean, I have a lot of colleagues who think it'll be longer than that, but I think it'll be shorter. I think within the, by this fall, you know, there's more than just vaccines. The rates are going down now, not because of the vaccines, it's because we are not gathering so much anymore. And then with the beautiful weather we're having now, people are going to be outside more, not so mm -hmm. much inside. And again, the rates will fall some more. And then hopefully with that happening and we get the vaccine out, that will go way, way down and we can maybe get back to normal by the fall. Um, I think this, is, this virus itself, it's like our other types of coronaviruses, it's gonna stay with us. I suspect that it's gonna continue to be less and less pathogenic, uh, in which case we'll be fine. Uh, it's just something that the, you know, the poor and underserved, the poor people, not the poor people, the people who are at high risk are gonna get infected and maybe not as much we're still going to have deaths from it probably in forever in my lifetime, but it'll be more like uh, the flu, for instance. We always get deaths every year from the flu, but it's something we can manage and, and mitigate. Um, you know, the big unknown is whether we're going to have future pandemics. Right. It this took us 100 years to have w another one like this. We've been relatively lucky with this. I don't want to scare anybody, but... This is a very infectious virus that has a very, very low mortality rate, but because it was so infectious, it killed a lot of people. Remember that SARS-1, which was the predecessor to this, uh, and there's MERS as well, which is ongoing in, in the Middle East, the Middle East uh, SARS virus, respiratory virus. Their mortality rates are 30%. So a third of people who get it die. Wow. That's incredible. Um, Fortunately for those, they weren't as infectious and, and you didn't infect people unless you got sick. And so we knew to isolate right. people. It's easier to control. But if we get a virus uh, that tra gets transmitted from an animal, which is how we get these things, then now is you can transmit it without you even being sick and it's 30% mortality, which is sort of what happened with the Spanish flu, then that's, that could be a disaster. So I think as a society, as a world, we need to prepare better for that, and we can do that. We are going to get another uh, epidemic for sure. Remember Zika two to three years ago. Right. We were all worried about Zika. Uh, fortunately, that went away. And then there's Ebola, uh, and then there's the SARS-1, MERS. I mean, we're going to keep getting these, and we need to be better prepared for this. So to put it in perspective, how many people in this country die from a bad flu year? What's the... Uh, a bad flu year, probably uh, just under 100,000 people. Um, but most years, it's probably more like 10 to 20,000 uh -huh. people. Back in uh, 2009, I think, when we had the, the bad flu season, mm -hmm. we had the, the estimates vary, at, vary, I'm sorry, but it was about 100,000 people that passed away with flu in that wow. year. But it was spread out. Um, and it was actually probably even over a year. And so we could handle that. Um, and a lot of people, um, yeah. I mean, we weren't as worried about it because we did have a vaccine and we did have some treatment for it as well. But yes, uh, we could get a flu that could be really bad and it could cause as bad as, as SARS, as uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, anyway, we need to be vigilant. I think we've learned a lot with this. Um, and next time that this, something like this were to happen, I think we can probably be better at responding to it. Well, is there any point you would like to make or any topic we didn't touch on that you think is important for people to know? No, I don't think so. I, we didn't, I, obviously I'm a vaccine person. I think it's important to get vaccinated. Um, as many people as possible mm -hmm. to get vaccinated. Uh, yeah, and, and um, you know, one thing I didn't mention that I think is important, a lot of people, well, what about the long-term side effects of vaccine? You know, most vaccines don't have long-term side effects. Vaccines in general, the side effects are going to occur within a month of the vaccine. After that, you don't get new side effects. Now, you may have something that's 
that continues after you had it initially, but we know what the side effects are of this vaccine, and um, most all the side effects are very short term. Uh, so I think these vaccines are safe, and it's important to get it. Okay. And uh, yeah. I've gotten my vaccine, and a lot of healthcare workers at UAB have gotten the vaccine. Yeah, and I've had mine with zero side effects. Yeah. Oh. So, so I think most people have done really well. Oh, well, great. Oh, remember the other thing too is that. COVID is so prevalent that you are, if you don't get vaccinated, you're likely going to get COVID eventually. And that's going to be much worse than, than getting a vaccine. So that's another reason to get vaccinated. Okay, well, thank you. Well, Paul, I've enjoyed talking to you so much. Every time I talk to you, I learn, <laughs> learn everything. I appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy. you got a pandemic to fight. We yeah. appreciate you taking your time thank to you. I enjoyed come it. and be with, here, be with us here today. I enjoyed it. Thanks Thank you again. very much for having me. Yeah, it was fun. Bye-bye.